Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here today. And the interesting thing is I look across the audience. We've got a real diversity of people in here. We've got dairy producers. We have extension educators. We have university people. Uh, we have uh, people from uh, various companies. We have people from uh, federal and state organizations. So we have a real diversity. And more importantly, we've got dairy producers. So it's really nifty to see the diversity. Okay, so I want to follow up a little bit with what Dave said and move ahead just a touch and be more specific on the dairy industry. And uh, <clears throat> there was recently a report put together in 2014. Art Degano from Cornell was one of the people from Cornell on it, uh, along with people from those you know, other organizations. And they tried to update the 2011 study that Dave and his group led. And... Um, this is sort of, uh, you've seen graphs, I sort of put it in numbers, uh, makes it easier for me. They're predicting across New York in the 2020s, uh, the temperature's going to be 2 to 3 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they were in the base period, which went up uh, not 71 through 2000. In the 50s, we're looking at 4 to 7. And the 80s, 5 to 10. So that's sort of a, to me, that makes it easier to think about. The other thing they did in this report is they looked at the impact on regions of the state and they divided New York State into six regions. I'm not going to show you all six, but they predicted the number of days it would be greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit in these different regions. And <clears throat> so I'm just going to show you a couple of them. Elmira, New York, the blue is the base period, which went up through 71 to 2000. About 10 days. Well, in the 20s, that's going to be up to 17, 18 days. And by the 50s, they're going to be up in, in the 30s. Saratoga, which is eastern New York, is very similar to Elmira in pattern. Watertown, which is sort of uh, northern, part of northern New York, you can see they had very few days, but they're going to have an increase. Indian Lake, which is in the Adirondacks, which is even further north, you can see the changes. So to me, it gives them indexes, and I didn't put on here the 2080s. The big change in the 2080s is in northern New York, is where it's really going to go up in the 80s compared to the 50s. So basically, our dairymen have to be thinking about, I've got two, three times as many days of heat stress to think about in my operation. I borrowed this slide from uh, Todd Pilby. Todd's on the program later. And this was the one that many of you have seen before. Norma St. Pierre, a number of years ago, estimated dairy industries losing almost $900 million a year. There was a recent paper in 2015 that tried to update some of this and estimate the losses to dairy industry. And they, they estimated $1.7 billion by 2050. The loss for New York, they said, would be about $39 million. And the loss in Wyoming County, which is in what western New York and one of our biggest dairy counties, they said about 2.3 million per year. I think these numbers look very conservative when I track back to pounds of milk change they're predicting per cow. But again, temperatures going up, it is an economic impact on our industry. Now, what does this really mean at a dairy farm? A few years ago, we had the opportunity to gather some data from a, a dairy farm. Uh, in eastern New York, you had about 800 cows. This was in August 2009. Uh, the closest weather station was Saratoga uh, Springs, so we used that data. The farm is within about 20 miles of there. Uh, it's an open ridge freestyle barn with a limited number of fans. So on this chart, we've got a number of things. This is dry matter intake on the bottom. You can see it's running along around 50 pounds, takes a dip comes back. Here's milk production in the red, running along, takes the dip, comes back. And the uh, mean temperature is the blue. You can see it took a hit here, went up, came back. And notice, here's 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So this was not an extreme heat stress situation. Now if we translate that to milk, on, there were 21 days I counted as normal days in that month. They were shipping 66,000 pounds of milk. The 10 days that were so-called heat stress days, 
That was 61. They lost about 4,600 pounds of milk in this mild heat stress. That's relatively mild, right? Depending on price of milk, that was uh, you know, $700 to $900 per day. How much more could they invest in a, heat, in a cooling system? And this was mild heat stress. OK. Heat stress is very simple. If the cow has more heat than she can get rid of, she's in heat stress. It's a pretty simple definition. Impacts on dairy cattle, we all know what, what they are. They eat less. Maintenance requirements go up, make less milk. Fat and protein contents tend to go down. We see that. Heifers grow slower. Calves born are smaller. Two cows that are under heat stress in the dry period. Reproduction goes down, more health disorders, and the immune system really gets taken a hit. These animals have less ability to fight a challenge because the immune status is lower. So how do cows respond? Body temperature goes up. I think Todd's going to be talking about some of that this afternoon in his session. They breathe more. Breath rates go up. Less activity. They don't walk around quite as much. Drink more water. They may need 30 to 50 percent more water. And a lot of our systems aren't adequate to provide that amount of extra water, either quantity or pressure or combinations. They'll look for shade. And they'll help you find the cool areas in the barn if they exist. You may see them clustered. Severity, pretty simple. What is temperature humidity? Length, night cooling. Yesterday was a very warm day. But the cows last night, it cooled off, didn't it? So they actually could take that. But if you get days like yesterday, two or three days in a row without night cooling, then the cows will show you the effect in terms of intake and milk production. The amount of ventilation and airflow you have, bigger cows, smaller cows, lower milk, higher milk, all those factors, availability of water, hair coat depth, even cow color. Think about cows in pasture. If you were out in a pasture yesterday in New York, would you rather be a white cow or a black cow? Just think about that. It has an impact. Now, I'm going to skip these slides. There's three slides we're going to skip fast because you've seen this before. THI, you've seen that. That's the third time you saw it, so you probably know what it means. Now, let's, but I think the temp THI, there's a big change here. Some work in Arizona a number of years ago said, wait a minute. The THI guideline we're using in 72 was put together many, many years ago with lower producing cows. Well, what about a higher producing cow? And so they did some work at Arizona, and the cows were 75, 80 pounds of milk per day. And they said, it looks like really, instead of 72, it's about 68. It's a lower threshold that the heat stress becomes important to the cow. And I think that, that makes sense. How about these cows that are making 100 pounds a day? Maybe some people are suggesting maybe a threshold of 64, 65 may be more appropriate. So I think the old thing we've used at 72 is probably outdated given the level of productivity that we're seeing in our herds today. And so our threshold, where the cow becomes sensitive, is lower in terms of that THI index than it used to be. And I think it just makes sense. The animal's working harder, so she's more sensitive to these changes and manipulations. Now, this is a quick summary of, of some work at, uh, again, Arizona. And it makes a key point, I think. They, they put these cows in metabolic chambers. They created different conditions of, of temperature and humidity, those interactions. And really what they found, as you would expect, in their, in their studies, oops, go back one, dry matter intake went down about 30%. Milk yield went down about 45%. When they fed cows, pear-fed cows, that were in a, a cool environment at the same level of intake of the cows in a hot environment, their, their milk only went down 
So what it says is, yes, intake does go down, but it accounts for maybe a maximum of 50% of the change in milk. The rest is metabolic alterations in the cow, specifically looking for more glucose to drive the system. So the, the milk response to heat stress is partly intake and partly metabolic changes within the animal. Reproduction, I think all of us uh, have seen this on, on farms that you work with or if you're a farmer, uh, have it yourself. Normally it tends to go down in the heat stress situations because we see changes in the, the intensity and length of the estrus period, which makes it more difficult to determine if the cow is in uh, appropriate status to be bred. Fertility rate usually goes down, follicle decreases, and if they have been bred a few days ago and they get heat stress, there's a higher risk of early embryonic death at that point. And also we know it has an impact on the growth of the fetus. The calendar stress tends normally to have a smaller calf. Now at the dairy science meetings uh, two, two weeks ago, there was some data presented uh, by Ben Scott, who's a graduate student uh, in animal science with Dr. Julio Giordano. And Julio is gonna be on this afternoon. And I thought this was an interesting slide. Um, this is some data from some herds in New York that they were working with on another project, and this is sort of, sort of a side, side issue uh, from the project they were on. So basically at the bottom, they, they, they used the 72 uh, as in this case. If the THI was above 72 for only a day ahead of when they bred the cow, reproduction, the conception rates went down percentage rate from 38 to 32. That's significant. If they had three days of THI, it went down. If they had seven days, it went down even more. All of those are significant. So that shows on real farms the impact of this heat stress on reproductive performance. The other chart they had, which I thought was very interesting, was the disease risk of the animals in the first 30 days after calving. So at the bottom you have the same type of situation. Oops, we'll go back. The blue is when the animals were in conditions where THI was less than 68. The red is when it was higher. Cows under heat stress have a higher risk of problems post-calving because of the stress and the, and the lower immune status of the animals. The other thing that happens is it changes some of the rumen environment in the rumen fermentation system. And it tends to lower the average pH in the rumen. The importance of that is once we get a rumen pH much lower than 6, 5.8 or 6 for a long period of time, we change the population of, of bacteria. We tend to get a shift in the types of end products produced. And we increase the risk of some acidosis and we also have lower efficiency in converting feed to milk. And so you can see whether the animals are on a high forage diet or a high grain diet, in both cases, as you get more hot conditions, you tend to lower that average rumen pH. So you're affecting ruminal fermentation, ruminal microbial bug population. Another one to think about, if you watch cows in heat stress, do they lay down less or more? Well, the work from uh, Wisconsin, Nigel Cook, when they've looked at the time budgets, says cows in a warm environment tend to stand up more. Why do they stand up more? Because they have more surface area exposed, right? And he found that in, in the studies that they did, on average, they spent three hours less a day lying in the stall and 1.6 hours more walking around and standing. Well, if they do that for many, many days, does that have a potential impact on foot health and or lameness in these animals? Now let's talk uh, just quickly about some other animal groups. Quite often we get all excited about milking cows and that's very important. But I think sometimes we have to think about the other animal groups in the farm. And the dry cows are one that I think people need to look more, spend more attention at than they have. Um, again, the dry cow, maintenance costs will go up 
as heat stress because of change in metabolism, breathing rate, things like that. They tend to have smaller calves. They're shifting nutrients away from fetal growth, partially. Their immune system is down around calving, which is at critical time. And that's why you saw maybe that increased risk of disease incidence in the first 30 days. They tend to have lower levels of immunoglobulins in the colostrum, and that provides the immunity to the young calf. And they have that higher risk of the post-calving problems that we talked about. And there have been, uh, I think we're up to eight or nine studies right now where they've looked at the impact of cooling a dry cow on post-calving performance in many ways, some of these. And I borrowed this slide from uh, Jeff Dahl, University of Florida. This is just one trial, but it shows the impact if you cool the cows in the dry period versus if you don't provide cooling in the dry period on milk production in the next lactation. And these studies are showing anywhere from 500 to 1,500 pounds less milk in the next lactation if we aren't cooling the dry cows in these heat stress situations. So I think it's one that we need to look at more than we have probably on many of our herds in the past. The other area is calves and heifers, replacement heifers. They tend to grow a little slower, maintenance is up, intakes down, so they don't have as much groceries to, to make uh, average daily gain. There was a, a paper uh, in Progressive Dairyman, uh, I think in May issue, uh, Mike Van Amberg and his graduate student Katie Andrews at Cornell uh, last year in June and July, just went to two or three farms and just made observations. So this is an observational study, not a, a controlled research study. One, bar, one farm had the calves in a barn that had mechanical ventilation. One had them in a barn that had natural ventilation. And the other had hutches with the back propped up trying to get more airflow underneath the hutch to help cool the calf. Average daily gain, two pounds, 1.88 and 0.67. Has anybody ever gone into a hutch when it's really hot outside, crawled inside, and see how bad it is? That could be a bad place, right? Kurt has, yeah. Now, there was an interesting paper at Dairy Science about two, year ago, two years ago from Texas, and they, they put some kind of a reflective film over top of the hutches, so the sun would hit the film and bounce off, and that lowered the temperature inside the hutch. I don't, haven't been able to find out if they found a commercial film yet that's available to do that, but it makes sense. If you can reflect the sun off, the internal hutch temperature is going to be more favorable for the calf. And as we said earlier, calves that are born to cows that were under stress in the dry period, they have a lower efficiency of, con of taking the immunoglobulins and using them at, to help build up the immunity in the calf. So they're smaller, the colostrum has less per unit of, of colostrum, and their efficiency conversion is lower. So even the calves that we don't often think about, we need to think about those in the heat stress situations. So we're going to wrap it up pretty quick here. All the projections are the number of days are going to go up. And we can argue all day how many. And if you come back in 2055, we'll tell you how many it was in 2050. The trend seems to be going one way. We can argue the days. It does have some potential significant implications on our industry in terms of milk, reproduction, and herd health. And I think we need to care, think about more than just the lactating cow. That cow is very important, obviously, but we need to think about the impacts on the other groups. Luckily, the cost of cooling some of the other groups is relatively low. And so the return can be relatively high in terms of return on investment. Our industry needs to continue implementing practices that help mitigate effects of heat stress. We see a lot more fans and sprinklers now than we did 10 years ago, but we still have too many farms that aren't using this type of technology. So we need to keep that moving ahead. These include barn design, ventilation cooling, 
nutrition and herd management programs and herd management practices. And there'll be some more talks in more depth and detail about some of these as we go through the rest of the day. So this I'm going to wrap up, and these cows say, what heat stress are you talking about? Okay. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>